Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we can use open data to see what trains are up to, or as the band the automatic might have put it, what's that coming over the hill? Well, it's 2P91, the 029, 0929 service to Penarth. Um, you've probably heard a lot about open data, and you've thought, how do I get some of that? And as there's quite a big overlap in interest between programming and trains, let's see what it's all about. So just a couple of notes. Firstly, this talks about open data, not big data. There is a lot of data, but not in a sort of big data way. Also, nothing in this talk will let you find anything much about the trains themselves, um, just what they're up to. Personally, I've got not very much interest in the little metal boxes on wheels. Some people get excited about steam trains, but I get excited about DTGR signaling systems. So, you know, see me for us, the fat controller, wondering what all these trains are. There's a lot to get through, and I want to help you understand how it works and what access we might have, rather than going through the code in much detail. So some stuff might zoom past quite quickly. The slides and the code samples and additional resources are all on GitHub. Um, I'll give the link at the end, and feel free to ask me questions all throughout the weekend. There should be some time for questions at the end as well. So there's three main sources of rail data in the UK. First up is Transport for London, who have the data for Tube and DLR, London Overground buses and trains, and trams, sorry. Then there's two different providers for the main rail network. There's the Rail Delivery Group. Um, they used to be called ATOC, and they're better known as National Rail. Um, it's owned by the rail franchise companies, and they mainly care about the services and the fares and things like that. Then there's Network Rail, who run sort of the infrastructure and the tracks and the signals, and they also have feeds, and these are more focused on sort of signaling and trains. You can spend ages playing with this data and understanding all the links between them, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a bit of a whirlwind introduction to that. So we'll start with TFL, purely because their data is relatively easy to access. I'm going to move quite quickly through it. It's a simple API. I just want to give you an understanding of how it fits together and what you can do with it. I'm assuming most of you know how to use a simple JSON API, um, and we can get on to the more complicated National Rail stuff afterwards. So TFL have a unified API, and it has very poor documentation, but it is quite easy to use. Also, the live train data, as in where a train is going, is quite easy to get hold of, and it's JSON, so it's nice and easy for us to use in Python. Unfortunately, the quality of the data is highly variable, and it's not always reliably available. Things I've had discussions many times with them about. Um, so for today, we're only interested in what tube trains are up to. Overground, DLR, trams, buses, it's all there, and all very similar, and if you want them, you can get them. So in the UK, every single stop has what's called a NAPTAN code. Uh, this is a National Public Transport Access node. You might have seen them in URLs in places. They look a bit like this. I picked the closest bus stop I could find to this place as well. Um, every single bus stop and railway station in the UK has one or more of these codes that uniquely identifies it. Now, the big railway don't care about this at all, but TFL do, so we'll pay attention. Thankfully, they give us a nice, easy way to look them up. Here is the URL, and we can search for our desired station. I've picked Osterley because it's quite small and simple. It's in West London, if any of you don't know where it is. Uh, and you can see that we get back a load of code. And we get back our ID there. And we also get back some useful data, like, for example, latitude and longitude, and the name of it, and things like that. So we can quite easily get information about tube, bus, all of those sort of things, and the stations. So thanks to the wonders of the internet, here's what's happening at Osterley, or what was happening a couple of weeks ago when I put it in. Um, this becomes harder to understand once you look at somewhere like Baker Street or something like that, which is quite a complicated station. But if you know the tube network and you know what data you're after, it's usually reasonably easy to work out what's going on. So if I break this out a bit, we have, well, we have uh, the destination, uh, both of the NAPTAN ID and the English name of the station to help us out. We can also find when the train is expected to arrive here. Um, this should be the same as appears on all the little screens that appear on the stations. It's not for very dull technical reasons, but it should be the same. Um, we can tell what platform it's at, um, although this is more accurate some places than others. 
we can find out where it is currently, which is very useful for tracking trains through the network. And we also have a vehicle ID as well, which looks very useful. It's actually linked to the timetable. It's nothing to do with the train itself. And here's that data, parsed and presented nicely, admittedly, from the TFL website. But you can do much better to just make a web page. For example, I made this. It's a Pi Zero W and Pi Moroni's wonderful inky fat. And it sits in my hallway and it tells me when the next trains are coming at my local station. And I did most of this in a couple of hours or so. And the majority of that time was making the display look nice. So you can very easily get hold of this data and use it. It's honestly as simple as just pulling it out from, a, from the TFL API. We want to know when it's going to Houston, because we don't want the trains that are going the other way. And that's as simple as that. And the rest of it is just making it look nice. So Python is obviously perfect for this. Uh, and I know many of you will have a Raspberry Pi sitting around that you've been waiting for a project for. Why not this? So, I'm not going to say any more about TFL because their data is easy to access. I'm in Cardiff and not in London. Um, timetables for the tube are much more complicated. And contrary to popular belief, they do run to a very strict timetable, of which there's an example on the screen. But unfortunately, the method of getting those is way outside the scope of this talk. It's provided in a format called Trans Exchange, and it's everything you'd expect from a specification designed to be all encompassing and do everything. So have a chat to me afterwards if you understand more about parsing several hundred megabyte XML documents, and you really don't. So how about the big railway? There's a system called Darwin, which is the easy to use system, but the terms and conditions are very onerous. So I'm gonna skip that for now, and we'll do it the hard way. You can use it, it's easy enough, but I say the terms and conditions just make it less fun for open data uses. So let's start with the timetables. There's an XML feed, but surprisingly the better option is a wonderful format called SIF, which goes back to the mainframe era. It's basically a text file where each line holds a record. And here's the record for the train I got here on Wednesday. And you can clearly see there's a bit of structure to it. There's some data at the top. Each of these lines is probably a station. There's some times there, things like that. And it's a lot simpler than it looks anyway. If we break it out, you just chop up the lines into pieces based on the specification. Um, I'll skim over this, it's all online, um, however they've just revamped their website and the PDF disappeared. But I've asked them to put it back and we'll get there in eventually. But you can see, it's a basic schedule, it's a new record, there's a UID, there's a start date and end date, which days the train runs on, express passage of train, it's all fairly simple stuff that you might want to know about a particular train. And here's the record for a station stop. And there's a couple of important points to note here. First, you'll note there's two different sets of times. The public times, these two, are what's printed in the timetable. And as you can see, the public train is publicly listed to part two minutes before it actually does. And this is very common on long distance trains to make sure everybody gets on the actual train. Schedule time is what the driver and the signal will actually list, will actually work to. The other important thing is the location ID. Now, the big railway doesn't care about the NAPTANs I talked about before. Uh, instead, it uses many different types of IDs just to be difficult. So here's three codes for Cardiff Central. The CRS code, the one at the top, is the one you may have seen used by booking systems. It's like how LHR is used to denote Heathrow Airport. The STANOX tends to be reported by the train movement system called TRUST. And the TIP block stands for train timing point location and tends to be used by the timetabling system. So why are there three codes? Well, most of this goes back to British Rail days, and the systems are there for different purposes. CRS codes are just used for reserving seats and booking tickets. The tip lock codes are for timetables, and the Stanox codes are much closer to the bare metal of actually running a railway. Um, so, a lot of the more interesting feeds use Stomp. And if ever you use RabbitMQ, it's a very similar system. There's a range of message keys you can subscribe to, and if you get messages, you get messages pushed out to you constantly. And I mean constantly, because these feeds contain exciting amounts of data to me. Um, so what sort of data do they have? Well, we can find out when trains move between timing points. 
which is the sort of thing you'll have seen online if you've used one of the open data laid railway sites like Real Train, Real Train Times and Open Train Times and things like that. Um, also, we can find out when, and more interestingly, why trains are cancelled, because what they tell you isn't necessarily the reason why they're cancelled. But if we really dig into the data, we can find a particular train moving between signals, and even what the signals of themselves are displaying. Ish. So let's take a quick look at how easy it is to get things from Stomp. We'll be using stomp.py, which isn't the most Pythonic of libraries, but it does at least work. And when I started working on this four or so years ago, it was a lot of trouble to find a working library for it. All the code is on GitHub, uh, and you'll also need to sign up for a, net a network rail open data account. And again, the link for that is in the GitHub repo. So we set up a very simple rail listener class. It adds a couple of messages, sorry, a couple of methods, a very simple error handler, and a very simple message handler. I've left the JSON loads in there. This, this will then contain a dict uh, of messages, uh, which are just, you know, sorry, a list of dicts of messages, um, and that will be messages about the railway network that we'll parse in a minute. A couple of set up, set up a couple of lines for the connection to network rail. This is the thing we're going to be listening to. This is train movements, all train operating companies. So there's a lot of data in this, and um, you might want to start with just one area if you don't want, because it does scroll up the screen quite quickly, as in very, very quickly. Um, yeah, there's a lot of data. And in this horrible code here, um, you'll see we've got a while loop, and it just pauses to avoid flooding the server with requests, basically. Uh, it stores messages for about a minute or so in the queue, but after a minute, you've lost them. Um, and if there's an error, it will just disconnect from the server. There's many ways of writing this. This is just the shortest way I could find. So after that, we get a lot of messages containing all these little nuggets of data. This one tells us that, I'll have to read this, Train 1J52, which was the 2032 service from London, Victoria to Southampton Central and Bognor Regis on Monday, passed from signal TB0477, signal TB0479 at 2106 and 34 seconds. And the best part about this seemingly useless piece of information is it relates to the movement of an actual 200 ton train, which I think is quite cool. And this signal somewhere near Mercham in Surrey. And if we were at that station, we'd have seen it go through. Now, I may well have blinded you with numbers and letters there. So let's take a very quick aside to look at how railway signaling works. At the moment in the UK, we mainly use fixed block signaling. For the purpose of this, we'll, we'll assume that's all that exists. Trainer are identified as being in blocks, similarly sized lengths of track, the entry of which is guarded by a signal. So this signal guards this block. The fundamental rule of railway signaling is that only one train can occupy each block at a time. Trains are big and heavy, and they take a long time to stop. Citation needed. Um, so they're given warning. If the signal's at red, the previous signal will be at yellow, because that gives the driver enough time to stop the train. On express lines, where trains are taking longer to stop, they actually have extra warning. They have a double yellow, and then a yellow, and then a red. And they've done like flashing greens and stuff in the past as well. So each of these signals has an area code, um, which is based on the signal box that controls it, and a unique, a, unique, a unique identifier. So in the previous example, it was TB, which is three bridges in West Sussex. And our train reporting code, uh, which is this one, is the link back to the timetable. Uh, it's not a straight one-to-one -one mapping. It's a bit complicated, but it's not too bad. You can see the signal numbers on the plate below each signal there. Um, so this is signal Y226 at York. And so next time you go on a train, write a few numbers down, and you can save time going to the station and train spotting and just sit and watch JSON feeds go past in your console instead. <laughs> so can you see what the signals are displaying? Well, yes and no. Here's some data, which looks completely pointless, from the Yoka signaling center near Glasgow. The data appears, appears as DF. What we're actually seeing here is that. Each bit means something. Could be a signal that's red, could be a level crossing that's shut, could be a route being set. We don't know, it's not published. We can try and work it out, and some people have done so brilliantly. Um, I've got a demo, if this exits, hang on. 
So this is a site called Open Train Times, which is made by someone called Pogs. Um, and this shows a panel of all the signals and trains in an area. This is obviously Cardiff Central, and hopefully a train will move, if we're lucky. And it's working. You might see a train move eventually. But he's got all of the signals on here. These are all the signals. They're red and green. I'm colorblind. I can't tell the difference. Um, at the stations, they have little buttons to tell you when a train's ready to leave. That appears on here as well. Everything's on there. And this is all being created with open data. I must stress, not by me. Um, but a number of railway staff end up using this because the data is so hard to get hold of otherwise. So we can all do stuff like this, right? Where is my mouse? Oh, there we go, something moved. This site was built by someone with very close ties to the industry. They actually work for the company that makes the feed that we receive. But most people don't have those ties. And the knowledge is still far too scattered and much too, hands in, much, too much in the hands of the rail companies and a few hobbyists. There doesn't seem to be a good reason for this, just that everyone wants to keep their hard work to themselves. But we like Python, right? We use open source code all day, every day. So why can't we make this open source? Why can't we gather together and produce a bunch of code for working with this stuff? Some of you out there will be brilliant data analysts who see my problem of does this bit refer to a signal and can solve it in your sleep. Because you can find out when a train's moving between points, so surely you can tell when it's gone red. So why not? I've given you everything you need to get started, and if you're inspired, why not take a look at the code and go and play and, and share what you find? All the slides and the code, and there's some useful links on the GitHub repo. Uh, you can access that at bit.ly Python uh, and both those links go to the same place. I'm trying to release as much rail related code as I can under open source, but it's taken some time to get there. If you've ever tried to release your own code as open source, you'll know why it takes a while to make it not look like a hacky mess. And the Raspberry Pi board I mentioned is also open source, not my GitHub, if you want to build one. That's all. Does anybody have any questions for Kirk? Yes. Your questions. So it's possible to see if a train is in a block? Yes. Is it possible, has anyone worked out, how to see, how to guess where in the block it is? No. So the, uh, the problem is that all this data is held by Network Rail and they consider it to be a security risk to find out. Now it's kind of not because, it, this, as I said, the sign number is written, the signal number is written below all the signals anyway. So it's not, it just takes time. So yes and no is my answer. There was a plan at some point to try and get the stuff into OpenStreetMap and plot all the signal locations on there, add the signal numbers, and then that would help you out. Um, I don't know if that's happened yet. I tried to look the other day, but every time I go on OpenStreetMap, they've changed everything and I can't work it out. But yeah, so yes and no. Is it still the case that the data doesn't show freight services, just passenger rail services? Uh, no, it's, it shows freight services, but it doesn't show the correct reporting ID for them. It's somewhat scrambled, but they are there. It's just if you don't get a, the, the, the reporting number is in a format of number, letter, number, number and the freight format, the freight services just appear with a kind of random set of letters and numbers. Someone was trying to find a way to back convert it at some point, but I don't know if they ever got around to it. Any, Any more questions? questions? Okay, um, thanks Kirk, and thanks for our two question askers for asking actual questions.